opportunity for the last seven years to work in Greenville with um, a great group of people building a cloud-based company. Um, so the talk tonight is the cloud as always. Um, I was not one of the ones who raised my hand in the back when Russell asked because cloud has gotten attached to so many different things. There's no way to understand everything that cloud is attached to these days. But hopefully with this, we can make a little headway in kind of explaining what it is. So to get started, um, way back in historical times, back in the 90s, late 90s, uh, people used to draw network diagrams. And these network diagrams you know, took a lot of time for network engineers to prepare. Um, each one of those probably represented a location. And there was lines that went between all of them. Um, complex to understand, complex to present, complex to prepare. There was some networking technology that came about. And all of a sudden, the cloud was born. So it was easier to draw. It was much easier to explain. And now network engineers didn't have to take a bunch of time drawing pictures. They could just put a big cloud in the middle. And all of a sudden, everything got easier. So that's the first kind of rendition of the cloud uh, from a networking topology standpoint. Uh, in 2006, um, Eric Schmidt was with Google at the time. He was CEO of Google. And it's the first reference to kind of a cloud computing architecture. So in 2006, he made reference to centralized computing with network connectivity for delivering computational services. Now, a lot's changed since 2006, but the foundations of what a cloud platform is really hasn't changed since that time. So as opposed to explaining everything that cloud is, I want to focus on three kind of concepts that are present in almost any cloud offering. So the first, first of all, it's available. Second of all, it's scalable. And lastly, it's simple. So let's delve into those three points and talk a little bit about each one of them. So what does available mean? Today, people with smartphones have access to more bandwidth than businesses did 10 years ago. Anywhere you walk around, you pretty much have a 4G signal with, with 10 megs of upload speed and the ability to do tons of processing on your phone. That availability is now so widespread that you're pretty much connected anywhere you are anytime. When you move inside of a facility, you now have the ability to have Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a higher bandwidth connectivity that allows you access to computational and internet type services at higher speeds than even your cell phone. And then lastly, fiber has been deployed in vast quantities to businesses, to, to residential areas, to almost anywhere that connects two physical facilities together. Now, why is this important? Cloud computing, computing only works if you have connections to where all the centralized services sit. With the rise of availability and connectivity, that allowed computing, to be, computing and processing powers to be more and more centralized. So let's talk about the next facet of cloud computing, which is scalability. So as you centralize computing, you need very large data centers to handle that. So the cloud, even though it's a concept, it's very real and tangible things that make up that cloud. There's companies inside of the cloud computing space today that most people recognize. They're termed hyperscalers. So what this term means is guys like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, they're building data centers that contain hundreds of thousands of square feet that are filled with tens of thousands of computers all over the world. So in the US alone, there's been 400 hyperscaler data centers built in the last eight years. Think about that from a computing and processing standpoint. How much these facilities can handle compared to an average business data center. And you say, why is all that needed? Think about it in terms of Greenville. Greenville has roughly about 12,000 businesses just in the, the metropolitan or county area. If each one of those businesses has a little 10 by 10 data center in its office, and all of them wanted to consolidate to one place, think about how much real estate and how much power and computing processing needs to go into that one location to just consolidate Greenville. 
Now think about that phenomenon happening all over the world and you understand why these hyperscalers are having to build data centers as fast as they can possibly build them. So when you think about scalability of cloud computing, you usually think about the vastness like I was talking about and the large data centers. <clears throat> but the other phenomena that's going on is really in the ability to scale downward. So cloud computing's model is that you don't own the computing resources or the storage facilities, you actually rent them. So this rental model allows people to consume only what they need of cloud computing. So if you only need it for a year, you only buy it for a year. If you only need it for a month, you buy it for a month. All the way down, if you only need it for a minute, you buy it for one minute. So what that does is it allows small businesses to take on services that were once only available to enterprises. So when you look at some of the software that's out there today that would be consumed in a Fortune 1000, Fortune 100 enterprise, some of that's available to the very smallest business today because it can be carved down and rented on that little increment that just that small business needs. So that phenomenon has allowed technology to migrate its way from the enterprise space all the way down to the small to medium business space. And it goes even further. If you look at it from an example like a researcher. So you've got a researcher that's working on a doctoral thesis. A long time ago, they had to go request computational resources, tens of thousands of dollars to handle their modeling projects <coughs> or whatever the needs were to come to the answers of whatever question they were trying to solve. Now with cloud computing, that researcher is able to focus on the problem as opposed to worrying about how he's going to go and satisfy the computational needs to, to solve that problem in a timely manner. It allows those researchers to take on more complex problems solving higher level issues than worrying about a cloud computer, or worrying about a computing platform. So when I was thinking about a good example to use around how all this kind of comes together, um, I just reached into my personal life and one example was we personally at home we had some HVAC work done. Um, and when it went in it felt like it was humid in the house. So my wife said, you know, we should probably check and see what the humidity is in the house. So this problem, while simple in nature, represents <clears throat> how cloud services are being consumed by an individual on a daily basis. So I'm saying that you, you go to Google, you search, you search for a humidif humidifier or a humidity monitor. Goes to Google's cloud platform, returns hygrometer. I had no idea what a hygrometer was until I Googled it. Gives you a link to Amazon. Click on Amazon. You go buy it. That runs off of Amazon's cloud platform. So we just engaged two cloud platforms. Amazon always sends you a nice confirmation email. That is accessed by my Office 365 email account, which runs on Microsoft's cloud platform. So now I'm at three platforms. <coughs> I receive in the mail a little bitty sensor. It has no screen on it, and it has two instructions. First instruction says activate battery by pulling a little tab. Second instruction says go download the app. So think about that from a product standpoint. So you go, I'm an Android guy. I go download from Android Play Store. I've just used Google's cloud service again by downloading an app to my phone from the Play Store. Within minutes, now I've got this little thing set up. I establish an account. The company's called Sensor Push. That account was created in Sensor Push's cloud environment that runs on Amazon resources and now is collecting information and I can go look at it from any device anywhere. So the, the complexity of fulfilling this service is completely masked using four or five different cloud providers all working together to basically accomplish a seemingly simple project. And so the last concept from a cloud computing standpoint is simplicity. And extremely complex problems are being solved and presented in the most simple fashion. When you think about these two items that are on the screen here, the first is assistance. 
So a $30 box that sits on your counter in your house connected via Wi-Fi is now capable of processing what you said to it, going and doing whatever you told it to do, whether it be cutting lights on, gathering information, and then returning that result to you all in real time. And it's able to do that because of the cloud computing resources and the artificial intelligence engines that sit at these cloud providers and make that service so simple that it's now being consumed by millions inside of their homes. The next one, just from a scale standpoint, if you think about it, is Waze. I don't know how many people in here use Waze. You love it, right? Think about the vastness of the data that has been collected to make Waze possible. It's taking millions of data points from phones all across the world, correlating them to tell you what the traffic is next to you. The fact that there's computational power to be able to discern a route from Greenville, South Carolina to Los Angeles in a matter of seconds telling you the traffic along the entire route takes an unbelievable amount of computing power. And it's all being presented in a simplified form, consumable by end users on a daily basis. And so when you think about cloud computing, what I'd say is think about these three concepts. It's always available, it's always scalable, and it's simple to consume. Thanks, everybody.